And let me briefly introduce the speakers. We have a very international lineup with Dr. Karis Templeton from the Hoover Institution of Stanford University from the United States. We have Dr. Wu Jiaxing and Dr. Huang Zhijian from the RC Army in Taiwan and the George Mason University at the United States. We have Astrid Lubinsky from the Department of East Asian Studies, Sinology at the University of Vienna, Austria. And joining online is Dr. Lukas Zamecki, who is a political science and international studies faculty at the University of Warsaw, Poland. So as you see, we cover a lot of ground across the globe on very different topics. We have topics about how democratic is Taiwan, evaluating 20 years of democratic development. We have topics on reforming military organizational culture in Taiwan and empirical study in the army. We have people talking about marriage equality and women's organizations in Taiwan, a coalition of the week. And we have people talking about youth activism and contentious politics in Taiwan from the perspective of relative deprivation and collective identity. So very important topics. Before we move on to the main part, which is the speakers, let me just briefly introduce the presentation rules. Each presenter will have 12 to 15 minutes. I will keep track of the time. And when there's five minutes left, I will hold up this sign saying, hey, there's only five minutes left. Try to speed up if you haven't. The last minute, we'll have a one minute sign where you can see one minute. And then there will be a time over, which I will kind of wave rigorously around. And hopefully, people will wrap up. All right, without further ado, let's welcome our first speaker, Dr. Karis Templeton from Stanford. Welcome. Uh, there it is. Great. OK. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. I'm Karis Templeman from uh, the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Um, this is a new paper that I'm presenting. Uh, it's fairly rough, um, so be kind. Uh, but if you're interested in it, it is on my website, um, and I invite you to download it there. Um, so the, the conceit for this paper, um, thank you. Um, so the conceit for this paper uh, was that I came across a paper that uh, the guy I worked for, Larry Diamond, who's also a major scholar of democracy around the world, uh, a, basically a talk that he gave in 2001, shortly after Taiwan's first transfer of power. Uh, and uh, he had spent some time in Taiwan in the 90s. He was very interested in Taiwan. And so he gave a talk kind of assessing the quality of democracy in Taiwan. Uh, and the title is, How Democratic is Taiwan? Uh, and uh, while he pointed out a lot of uh, major democratic achievements that Taiwan had accomplished in the 1990s, uh, he had five key challenges, five problem areas that uh, he highlighted in this talk. So those are um, corruption and Heijin or black gold politics. Um, so it was not uncommon to have uh, gangster legislators in the Taiwanese Li Fa Yen. And uh, this guy is notorious, uh, Luo Fu Zhu, for actually beating other legislators uh, when they insulted him. Um, weak law and weak rule of law and uh, a, a insufficiently independent judiciary. Uh, so there's a major scandal in the 1990s that was never fully prosecuted, the Lafayette scandal. Uh, the guy uh, directly involved in stealing about $500 million from the Taiwanese purse, uh, absconded abroad, was never captured. Um, Ma ying uh, at the time, was appointed the Minister of Justice. Uh, he was then forced out because he was a little too effective in combating some of the political corruption. Um, the third challenge, uh, partisan polarization and ethnicity. Uh, Diamond was really concerned that uh, national identity and the ethnic subdivide in Taiwan were increasingly mapping onto the partisan divide, that that would perhaps lead to a kind of bidding up or a ethnic outbidding in Taiwan and could tear the country apart. Um, he was also concerned that the constitution was rather ambiguous about whether Taiwan is a presidential system or a parliamentary system or somewhere in between. Uh, and that, in fact, there was a big fight when Chen Shui-bian came into office about whether he had the right to appoint the premier without consulting the legislature. Um, and then finally, uh, democratic values and uh, support for democracy at the mass level. Uh, if you look at public opinion polls from the 1990s, was fairly weak relative to other uh, third wave democracies. Um, and so those were five big challenges that give us a nice snapshot of both uh, what was good about Taiwan, but especially the things that uh, he was concerned about. Um, so the conceit of this paper is I thought, 
it's 2022. Um, let's see how far Taiwan has come. Um, and so let's evaluate, has there been progress? Uh, if so, in what areas? Uh, and uh, to do this, I, I thought I'd start by uh, giving a, uh, a perspective from some of the comparative democracy indices. Uh, there's a lot of comparative democracy indices out there now. Uh, I'm gonna give you four different ones. Uh, so if you're concerned about bias from Freedom House, uh, we can go to the Europeans. Uh, if you're concerned about the Europeans, we can go to the Varieties of Democracy Project, which has everybody involved in it. Um, so let me just give you a snapshot of 2021 in Taiwan, uh, the last year that we have uh, democracy indices um, rating for this country. Uh, Freedom House last year upgraded Taiwan to a 94 out of 100 uh, as their overall liberal democracy index. Um, and uh, that's the highest score they've ever given Taiwan. Uh, it puts Taiwan in pretty rarefied company. Uh, they're in the top 20 democracies in the world by this score. Uh, and 94 is equivalent to, uh, so they share that they're tied uh, with Germany uh, now. So uh, according to Freedom House, Taiwan is as democratic as Germany today. Um, the Economist Intelligence Unit, uh, if you don't like Freedom House in Washington, DC, well, let's go across the, the pond to the UK. Uh, their measure, they've actually bumped Taiwan up quite a bit in the last couple of years. Taiwan, to them, is now ranked eighth in the world. Uh, it is well above uh, South Korea and actually above Japan even. It's sandwiched between Ireland and Australia now. So according to uh, the economists, folks, Taiwan is uh, quite democratic as well. Um, Bertelsmann Transformation Index, if we go over to Europe, uh, this has a, a broader set of uh, indicators that they measure. Uh, among them is something called the Political Transformation Index. And Taiwan uh, last year reached its highest score ever on this as well, 9.6 out of 10. Uh, that puts them, they don't do OECD countries, so they don't do the Western developed democracies, but they do every other country in the world. That puts them third below Estonia and Uruguay. Um, so according to BTI, Taiwan is in pretty, pretty good company as well. Uh, and then the fourth, uh, which is a little more pessimistic on Taiwan, is the Varieties of Democracy Project. Um, but even VDEM uh, has Taiwan in the top 20% uh, of all regimes. Uh, it's very close to the United States now and to the Czech Republic. Uh, it's ranked 32nd overall. Um, and so at least according to this uh, pretty broad array of comparative democracy indices, Taiwan looks like a liberal democracy today. Um, if we move from that kind of comparative uh, quantitative data to a more qualitative take, um, I, uh, in the paper I go through each of these problem areas in some detail, and I try to make the argument that there's been improvement in all five areas. Uh, so uh, first, Significant improvements in uh, the uh, amount and the severity of vote buying. Uh, political corruption, I argue, is much less common than it used to be in Taiwan. Part of this is due to some reform of the prosecutor's offices. Prosecutors are actually quite aggressive now in prosecuting vote buying and political corruption. Um, several legislators have actually had to resign as a result of being charged with vote buying. That was not something that happened in the 1990s. Uh, so this is a major shift from the, the pre-2000 period. Uh, and then, uh, I don't know how much attention this got outside of Taiwan, but for the first time ever, the Li Fa Yuan actually approved the arrest of sitting legislators. Uh, there were five charged with corruption, and the party caucuses got together and said, yes, the, the prosecutors can actually come in, will waive immunity for these legislators, uh, and they had to all then resign their seats. Uh, so that's a major shift as well. This was something Diamond uh, complained at length about in his speech in 2001. Um, finally, I've got a couple indicators on this measure from a VDEM. Uh, VDEM has a measure of how severe vote buying is. Uh, lower is worse, higher is better. Um, uh, Taiwan looks like it's had some significant improvements since 2015 on this measure. All right. um, second, uh, rule of law and judicial independence. Uh, I argue in the paper this is still a relative weak point uh, compared to other parts of Taiwan's uh, democratic uh, institutions. The judiciary still offer, suffers from low public trust, uh, close ties between prosecutors and judges. Uh, Taiwan's international isolation means that a lot of uh, people who are charged with corruption can flee abroad and then Taiwan can never lay their hands on them. Um, but there has been significant progress in this area as well. The Constitutional Court, in fact, has been a, a significant force for uh, protection of defendants' rights and for general uh, uh, liberal strengthening of the rule of law in Taiwan. Um, and uh, so 
Uh, if we look at uh, a couple indicators uh, from VDEM on this, uh, here's an indicator of just overall general political corruption. Uh, high is bad, low is good. Uh, generally, there seems to be a downward trend and then an accelerated downward trend after 2015. So VDEM offers some support that political corruption has declined. If we look at rule of law, the rule of law index suggests uh, the rule of law has strengthened again since uh, this post-2015 period There's a significant uptick, right? Uh, the third, uh, partisan polarization around national identity and ethnicity. Uh, I argue in the paper that there's, at least at the elite level, there's really been a kind of convergence on uh, an embrace of both ROC institutions and the name Taiwan and the idea that this is a separate entity, but it, Republic of China doesn't need to be uh, that name doesn't need to be tossed out. Tsai Ing-wen, in fact, um, has actually embraced the Republic of China constitutional framework. She did that in her first inauguration speech. Uh, there's also, if you look at public opinion data, convergence on the idea that Taiwanese are just Taiwanese as their nationality. So it's, it's a less salient or less uh, disruptive cleavage. Uh, and then um, the old Ban Shengren, Wai Shengren that Diamond was focused on, uh, that, that divide uh, has uh, weakened in salience as well through intermarriage and new people coming up through the educational system, matters a lot less what your Shengji was uh, than it did even 20 years ago. Um, the VDEM actually offers some conflicting uh, data on this. Uh, VDEM has this uh, standard polarization measurement um, that uh, shows actually polarization low in the mid 2000s during the Chen Shui-bian era and then rising uh, after about 2014. Uh, I don't really know why and I haven't had a chance to really dig into their polarization measure, uh, but I have put a couple other countries up here uh, just for contrast. Korea is much more polarized according to VDEM than even Taiwan was. Um, uh, and the United States now according to VDEM is polarized, more polarized than either one. Um, so, um, fourth, in the interest of time, I'll go through this very quickly, but uh, constitutional defects. Uh, Taiwan has made a bunch of kind of subtle institutional reforms over the last 20 years that, in effect, have done a lot of what Diamond called for in 2001. Um, Taiwan, in practice, functions like a presidential regime now. There's not a whole lot of dispute about the president's ability to appoint the premier without legislative confirmation. Um, Taiwan eliminated the single non-transferable vote system for the legislature um, that has produced more disproportional outcomes in the legislature, but it's also eliminated uh, the coordination problem within parties, and it's also made it harder for factions to support a factional candidate. You actually have to win a broad constituency. Um, uh, the democratic hardware in Taiwan, I think, is still flawed in some ways, but uh, what I call the software, the kind of uh, informal norms and respect for um, kind of nonviolent outcomes, I think the Sunflower Movement and it's uh, the resolution of that movement in a, a peaceful resolution that was then uh, channeled into uh, electoral competition, I think demonstrates that Taiwan has pretty good kind of software, the, the kind of uh, willingness to compromise and find nonviolent solutions um, uh, is good in Taiwan. Um, finally, uh, mass democratic values. Uh, like a lot of democracies, Taiwan has rising distrust in political institutions. Um, so uh, I've got four waves of the Asia Barometer survey here, uh, which showed declining trust in just about every institution. Political parties are at the bottom of this. Uh, everybody hates political parties. Um, uh, it may be surprising to Americans in the room, but uh, the police are the single most trusted institution in Taiwan, uh, and they're the only one above 50% now in Taiwan. Um, uh, but uh, there is, uh, if we look more broadly, there is modest increase over time in support for democracy and rejection of authoritarian values. Um, so uh, the thing to focus on here is the, uh, the black part. Is the black part getting larger or smaller? This is authoritarian values. It's getting smaller. Um, similarly here, um, a desired level of democracy uh, has increased a, a little bit. Uh, preference for democracy uh, has generally gone up. Uh, suitability of democracy for Taiwan, that's been in a, a rising direction. Um, democratic value orientations, indirect support for democracy. This is actually some of the most promising data. Um, there's been uh, an increase over every wave uh, among the mass public uh, in support for these kind of indirect measures of democracy. Um, also, I should note as a caveat, these data don't include the most recent uh, Asia Barometer survey. 
Uh, if anybody has that data and would like to add it in, I'm really curious to see uh, where we stand now after Tsai Ing-wen took office, after the Sunflower Movement uh, kind of got integrated into electoral politics. Um, in the last uh, remaining couple minutes here, I'll talk about the remaining weaknesses that I see in Taiwan's uh, democratic system. Uh, one is I think there still is some, some institutional um, ambiguity. Presidential executive relations are not fully uh, institutionalized in the way that we would like. Uh, the legislative process, as demonstrated by the evaluation of the cross-strait trade and services agreement, uh, the way that that uh, agreement was dealt with by the legislature was kind of ad hoc, and there was a lot of dispute over whether the legislature had a right to block it or whether they should actually hold a vote on it. Um, the electoral system, as I've noted, uh, is more dis disproportional than in the past. Uh, that uh, could lead to problems at some point. Um, and then... Uh, second, this is a big area, big long-standing area of concern. Um, media ethics and professionalism uh, are a low point in Taiwan, uh, and the information environment itself has become uh, increasingly susceptible to overseas influence campaigns. And so the CCP's uh, attempts to influence the 2020 election are a good case in point. Um, Finally, uh, trust in the judicial system and respect for rule of law, I think, could be better. Uh, Tsai Ing-wen, when, when she came into office, promised a series of judicial reforms. Uh, most of those have not seen the light of day. Um, it's not clear to me whether they will, uh, whether anything significant will pass before the end of her term. Uh, and then finally, the direct democracy agenda, um, recalls and referendums. I uh, argue in the paper has really kind of gone off the rails and uh, has. It's not clear to me that that has been a net positive for Taiwan's democracy. Uh, so summing up, Taiwan in democracy today is a success story. Uh, comparative indices show Taiwan is a high-quality liberal democracy. Uh, it's made significant progress in all five of Diamond's problem areas. Um, the remaining weaknesses, there are weaknesses. Uh, I argue that some of the most serious ones are certainly not unique to Taiwan. Uh, a lot of democracies are struggling with the rise of social media, the virality of fake news, and that sort of thing. Uh, and But the thing that really is unique to Taiwan is they're on the front lines of uh, rising PRC influence around the world. And so uh, the biggest threat to democracy, and this is a real change from Diamond 2001, where he barely mentions the PRC at all. Now the PRC is like front and center in the threat to Taiwan's democratic survival. So thanks. Uh, I invite you to read the paper. It is online. Uh, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Templeman, for this wonderful presentation. Next, we welcome Dr. Wu and Dr. Huang on their presentation. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, actually, I am not a doctor yet. I just a uh, first year of P uh, PhD student at Danjiang University. I'm also a, an uh, active soldier in Taiwan. And so I am the director of operational development team at the Army uh, Electronic Communication and international uh, information training center, uh, which is underneath the army headquarter. So today I'm going to present the reforming organization. Sorry about the PowerPoint. Uh, I can't see the full screen of my PowerPoint. So it's about uh, reforming uh, organizational culture in Taiwan and empirical study in the army. Uh, before I commence my, uh, my report, and I would like to say to you that this is a sensitive topic in the army, because uh, as a soldier, um, it's really hard to be open-minded to the issue that we face in the military, since that we are ashamed to expose our weakness. So uh, I'm very happy that my superiors uh, support me to do this, uh, to conduct this research, because that it reveals the real problems inside our society. So this is the overview of my uh, presentation. So I'm going to talk about how the death of Army Corporal Hong Zhongqiu involved, evoked the transformation of Taiwan's military leadership and the theoretical framework that uh, was conducted by the Institute of National Defense and uh, Security Research. And the four roles that I found out in my research uh, during the process of policy uh, making and then I'm going to have a conclusion and a suggestion. So um, as you may know that uh, the Army Corporal Hong Zhongqiu died amid his detention three days before his military service ended in 2013. And because he violated 
the military security regulation and to carry a camera phone into the barracks area. Um, so Huang, uh, Hong was placed in a, a solitary, solitary uh, confinement to perform exercise, then collapse of heart stroke and multiple organ failure. So in the, uh, in, uh, in the aftermath of Hong's death, the weakness of military management in Taiwan has been spotlighted. The defense minister even uh, resigned following the outrage protest to quell the public. As you may know that actually the uh, President Tsai, she was uh, part of this protest as well uh, before she got elected. Um, so as a result, the lawmaker and the government are urged the ministry Ministry of National Defense to reveal its management system seriously. Uh, in her inauguration address on 21st of 2020, which is the second turn of uh, Tsai ing uh, presidential uh, role, and she unprecedentedly listed the improvement of military management institution as a part of uh, her national security policy. So that she uh, asked the uh, national, I mean, the ND, INDSR to conduct the thorough uh, research about what's going on in the military, what caused the value of uh, military management. So he uh, generalized five cultural, uh, organizational culture to interpret the value of military management, which he uh, said there are five. Uh, so one is uh, leadership culture and uh, gender culture, personnel culture, uh, reward and punishment culture and management culture. And uh, as an insider, I am less convinced about these five organizational culture that could fully explain the value of military management. Uh, uh, for example, that he, uh, he said that there are two types of uh, leadership culture. Uh, one is open-minded, the other one is authoritarian. Um, I argue there are more than that, um, and I, I'll explain that later. So I'll take myself as, as an example. I have studied abroad and I have experience working with American soldiers. So I would consider myself as an uh, open-minded leader However, I have my spirit about me. How can I fully express my open-minded leadership without considering there is a traditional or like authoritarian spirit about me? Um, so the, uh, the personnel culture, uh, he was talking about uh, because we respect the, uh, the senior, seniors, uh, even though my rank could be lower than someone who's younger than me. Uh, for example, I'm a lieutenant, lieutenant colonel, now, colonel now, and my uh, junior could be a colonel. So that is kind of a culture that we have in the military. Uh, so that is a part of our uh, personal culture, but it does not affect the way that we lead our groups. And the uh, reward punishment culture that I was talking about when it comes to punishment, that will goes to a command chan, which uh, is like, okay, for example, if I'm a, a company commander and one of my soldiers, he uh, drunk and drive, and I will be punished because of that. That's our culture. But when it comes to reward, uh, it's not going to be the same. So uh, if something, uh, if some, some of my uh, staff is doing good, he's the one who's going to be rewarded, not me. So this is, uh, the the reward and punishment culture that he was talking about, and the management culture, and you say that oh because it, uh, it's an obedient culture that everyone has to follow the order, and the formality oriented. So here he was talking about um, most of the most of the the policy that we follow is based on the formality, which means it's probably is not really effective, uh, which is really not that's uh, efficient. But I will argue that he, uh, why he's doing this con uh, research, 
he does not consider the hierarchy systems in our uh, in our military society. Uh, as I not mentioned before, uh, there are senior uh, management, middle management, and the lower management as well. So you uh, you cannot be fully you in the in this hierarchical system in the military as a leader. And the other uh, question I will argue is that uh, he has not he has not taken uh, he has not been taking into consideration about the natural troop. For example, we have infantry, we have uh, artillery, armor, and uh, en uh, civil engineer. And me, my personal my my troop is communication uh, unit, and also we have a chemistry unit and then uh, not to mention there are navy and air forces um so those are uh, the characteristic that he has not considered and um, so i would argue that uh, we have to think about the natural of the troops and their missions that could affect the way uh, the organization culture was founded So th these are my research questions, because um, we know that uh, how uh, a policy is founded could be uh, could be effective to the uh, the result of the policy. That's why I tried. Uh, I wanted to uh, figure out what roles was involved during the entire process of um, uh, policy making. So those are the questions I list. And I found out, uh, uh, so it is a uh, mixed method research. First of all, I conducted uh, individual interview to try to figure out what roles are involved, involved during the entire process of policy making. So I found out that they uh, also, uh, I interview from the top to private, for example, the general to, to the uh, private uh, soldiers and ask them when they, what's the, their opinions during a one specific policy. And so I found out that, sorry about the, uh, the PowerPoint, there are four roles uh, involved in the policy making. First is policy initiator, and the second is policy maker, and the third one is policy implementer, and the, the, uh, the final one is service target. So because of hierarchy systems that uh, once the policy was initiated by the high-ranking officer, there's, there is no thorough research. So it means like if our minister of defense, he's thinking about a new policy, we are going to do it without doing any research because we are the army who cares about effect effectiveness. And so the policymaker will just follow the 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 willingness of the or the wish of the policy initiator, without uh, asking what is the need of the service target, the role of service target, and then so that's the hierarchy system when we conduct uh, when we implement a policy. So uh, this is the outcome of my uh, questionnaire, and I there is another. Uh, another thing that I found out that uh, when I interview individual soldiers, they are uh, cautious about whether they are going to be uh, in public or not. So it's, a, a, it's better that off record, but it's really hard for me to do that if that's off record. But of course I could take out their names or their rank but uh, uh, it's quite a sensitive uh, topic, so they don't want to be interviewed. That's just in case, in case that one day he or someone will, not, or will be in the spotlight. So uh, it's a good way to use questionnaire by uh, Google Forms, because you send out a link, and then they have no uh, uh, pressures doing the questionnaire. So uh, it's easy, and it's also efficient to collect the data. So uh, uh, the, the, the policy I'm, I'm asking is about a club activity that was uh, initiated by our former Minister of Defense, Yen Defa. And in order to uh, promote 
the all our defense, uh, like all volunteer soldiers that he uh, issued a club activity in the army or in the entire armed forces. And but it turns out to be that uh, well, you see that on, it's below three. Three means that it's uh, less interesting about this policy. So no matter your rank is, and um, they were not happy about this policy, which will not be known by Minister of Defense. And this is the decision uh, decision tree that I used uh, in our language. Uh, the outcome shows the same, but it gives you a good idea the who, which rank or the gender or the the, the troops um, that uh, give you the outcome of their preference about this policy. So the conclusion is that uh, the leader center organizational behavior model um, will be one of the um, reason or the determining factor that caused the failure of management in Taiwan's uh, military. And the positive relations between inconsistent policy and organization behavior. And the third conclusion I will make is authoritarian leadership is irrelevant with the effectiveness of any policy. So my suggestion is that a partnership, partner, partnership organizational leadership model could be a good uh, way that Taiwan uh, soldiers can think about it. Uh, this is the inspiration that I got from uh, American soldiers. Uh, when I received the intelligence captain course in Arizona, I found out that interaction with the uh, American soldiers that they are more like uh, brothers and sisters when it comes to making decision, and which is uh, a good value to Taiwanese army. Um, there's another reason why we are unable to do so because there's no, there's zero experience of going battle field. And because of a China issue that we won't be able to cooperate with other foreign soldiers except for American soldiers. So uh, the, the, the second suggestion is that uh, we, whenever who wants to conduct uh, military uh, research, it's, it's better to take into consideration about the natural of troops. And the policy might not apply to every troops in the ROC army. So, so, so uh, this, after this uh, research, I'm glad that the uh, three-star general now in the army headquarters, he kind of canceled the ac uh, club activity after reading my research. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Du Wu, uh, for the presentation of uh, the military organization. Next, we have Dr. Lipinski. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. And then using this. OK, this is the third paper showing the, the, you that our panelists actually very different uh, in although uh, we might refer to uh, each other in some of our conclusions. So my topic of today is the famous Taiwan marriage equality. Actually, the title came from my German experience. And so the title is not true for Taiwan. Uh, I need to change it at a right later point in Taiwan. Um, it is surely wrong uh, to considering women's organizations nor the same-sex organizations as weak um, civil organizations. However, their relationship to or with the state or the state relationship to such organizations is quite interesting and might be considered to be Taiwan-specific singular. Uh, because I only have 15 minutes, uh, I'm not going to cover the details of the legislative process. You might have a look um, at my paper uh, that has more on it. Same-sex marriage uh, is 
this support, society support for same-sex marriage is increasing, going up. Uh, I found uh, research done by the government on the support for same-sex marriage just two weeks, just a month, over a month ago. Uh, so as you can see, uh, in the last four years, um, the number of backers for same-sex marriage increased quite a lot. Uh, coming um, up to a total number of uh, of a majority of people in Taiwan, of the quest people questioned um, supporting same-sex marriage. Nevertheless, there is a statistics at the same time telling you that the total number of marriages, same-sex marriage and heterosexual marriages actually decreased since 2009. Um, there are also reasons to find this development. The reason mostly mentioned is the global financial crisis, um, stopping marriage plans by uh, numerous couples, potential couples. Um, and uh, what we find is that although we do have same-sex marriage, um, the number the total number of marriages did not increase. Yes. Um, then, as my title told you, I would like to talk about the feminist support for same-sex marriage. And as you can see here, uh, the one of the most famous icons supporting uh, same-sex marriage in Taiwan from a feminist perspective is your menu. Uh, interestingly, we do have her support, the personal support of lawyer, former legislator Yo, but we do not have a movement, a so-called feminist movement in Taiwan supporting um, same-sex marriage or focusing on same-sex marriage to, um, uh, in, as a feminist issue. Uh, this is not so interesting. Um, so what we actually find is that um, marriage equality, as it is often named by media, does not exist as it is in Taiwan. As you know, uh, Taiwanese politicians could only agree on the Act for Implementation of Judicial UN Interpretation Number 748. So the law, as it is, does not have same-sex or homosexual, and um, most important, does not have the term marriage uh, in the name of the law. But what he found is actually the public is indifferent on the issue. Um, as you saw many times, Thai the Taiwanese population is confronted by many surveys. Uh, everybody likes to do surveys very much. Um, and these surveys found that the public is not really interested on discussing the lack of the term uh, of marriage in their legislation. Well, yeah, um, it, uh, seen from a foreigner's point of view, the most interesting aspect of the non-existing same-sex marriage law, of the existing law, is that it does not cover um, the marriages between Taiwanese and foreigners if the place the foreign person comes from does not accept same-sex marriage as it is. Um, because the reason is this law, uh, the famous act governing the choice of law in civil matters involving foreign elements um, has been changed last in 2010, um, much before the discussion about same-sex marriages began. And its articles uh, are currently open to revision, but currently would 
include the impossible lity of a marriage um, between a same sex marriage between a country um, that does not accept same sex marriage as it is. Uh, meaning, and the effect would be that cross-national same-sex marriage is neither allowed in Taiwan nor in a third country if such country um, does not have a legislation allowing same-sex marriage. For me, and I found that actually um, same-sex marriage is an option for global uh, Taiwan outreach, and therefore I'm coming back to Mr. Templeman's paper. I think the global importance of same-sex marriage is um, very important. One is the famous Taiwan Pride uh, this year. We are going to have number 20. Um, and as you know, many people are going to attend the annual Taiwan Pride. This year's is going to be on 29th October. The first Taiwan Pride, much smaller one, was in 2003. Um, now, nowadays, this year, Taiwan is considered to be man, one of the most friendly LGBTQI nations in Asia. Uh, and the government uses this point. As you can see, with World Pride um, in three years. World Pride in three years is going to be in Kaohsiung. And interestingly, because we are currently in Washington, DC, um, actually Kaohsiung was the opposing candidate, opposing to Washington. And uh, the worldwide organization voted and Washington sort of lost. Um, Kaohsiung won uh, and is going uh, to have the first World Pride in Asia at all. Uh, there has never been one in Asia at all, so the first one is going to be in Taiwan. Of course, very much supported by the Taiwan government. As you can see here, there have been World Prides in Rome, Jerusalem, London, Toronto, Madrid, New York, so basically Europe, uh, Western Europe, um, and um, America. Uh, the Americas. Uh, so interestingly, if you look at the places, there's really a certain development. If you are going to switch from Sydney in 2002-3 next year to Kaohsiung in another two years' time. Uh, good. Um, what I would like to point out is that these international developments are very important for the global outreach of Taiwan policy at all points. Um, and if you are going to analyze the, the international status or position Taiwan does have, uh, obviously the LGBTIQ topic is a topic that can be used to gain um, international visibility and prominence. Yeah, um, this advocacy, how to describe it? This advocacy is partly done by NGO, civil society, um, but also very importantly done by the government itself. Uh, so um, the end, Coming to our next presentation, so I'm not going to stay here, but I wanted to point out that the important of importance of young people is um, has to be evaluated, and this uh, could also be thought back to um, Dr. Templeman's presentation. I think it's part of this very important group 
and the very important events that you find main mentioned on the slides that um, are going to uh, push Taiwan forward internationally and nationally. Okay. How oh, doesn't work? Yes. Um, I want to uh, finish by again pointing out the uh, cooperation between uh, Taiwanese government and uh, NGO or so-called civil society. Um, Professor He, He Mingxiu, has done research on this point, and it's very important because if we do uh, watch, take a watch from the European perspective, we would probably be looking more to the non-governmental part. But if we do that while we are researching Taiwan, that would probably be uh, the wrong perspective. Uh, and one last example for this cooperation between uh, government and MOFA, also the sponsor, one of the sponsors of this conference, and uh, NGO. The government had the idea to launch a Taiwan Gender Equality Week in 2020. This was not an NGO or women's movement idea, but a government idea. And they are running this Taiwan Gender Equality Week um, for the third year this year, having started, having begun March 8th. And if you are going to check uh, the Taiwan Equality, Taiwan Gender Equality Week online, uh, you are going to find that based on government initiatives, including uh, the opening of the event by President Tsai ing um, the government organizer, organizer actually sort of includes um, NGO or NGO organizations, uh, whereas the NGO side is not the proactive side. Um, yeah, uh, I think more discussion would be valid. And thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Dr. Lipinski. Uh, next, we have Dr. Zameki, who will be joining us online. Dr. Zameki, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully you can uh, hear me uh, clearly and loudly. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation uh, to take part in this uh, Taiwan, um, uh, uh, the World uh, Congress on uh, Taiwan Studies. It's my great pleasure. I really miss that I cannot be uh, in uh, Seattle, um, uh, but hopefully uh, this is uh, not my, this is my first time, but hopefully not the last time uh, that I can attend uh, Congress. So hopefully you will uh, I, I will be able to meet uh, you in Taipei during the next fifth uh, uh, Taiwan uh, Congress. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, um, I will start, uh, since we have a limited time, I will start shortly. My, uh, my presentation uh, concerns the um, quite well-known uh, a well-known uh, topic, uh, uh, but let me introduce the uh, uh, the way that I I wanted to to study that. Uh, the title is "Why Did uh, Taiwanese Youth Protest in 2014?" You already could hear that um, I've tried to restudy the reasons and the factors uh, uh, for the uh, youth uh, continuous politics in Taiwan in 2014 from the perspective of relative deprivation and uh, and collective uh, identity. Uh, so, although Taiwan um, experienced Sunflower Movement in 2014, it's already eight years. Uh, so uh, we know that uh, uh, that uh, organizing uh, organizing the 
the studies, the, the research, collecting the data can be uh, can be quite challenging. But uh, in a in a second, I will I will present the data that uh, I used. But the idea for the um, uh, for the study that I conducted in 2021 and at the beginning of 2022 was a kind of restudy, uh, restudy that from the perspective of uh, of already mentioned uh, um, psycho uh, social psychological uh, factors that uh, influence the the youth uh, to take part in the uh, in the protests, in the sunflower movement, in the continuous politics as such uh, in, in Taiwan. Um, so we already have a lot of uh, papers uh, on that, but uh, the uh, novelty of, of uh, my presentation, the idea was to, uh, to restudy that from that uh, uh, perspective. Um, in my studies, I tried to, to use, of course, the uh, well-known uh, research uh, inter alia of uh, Bert Klandermans or other uh, social psychologists uh, that research the reasons for collective mobilization. Uh, and I tried to divide along the, uh, according the, uh, the papers that we, the research that we, that we have of, uh, on the collective mobilization, uh, the reasons uh, on the supply side and demand side of uh, 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 of uh, um, uh, uh, mobilization process. Uh, so, uh, in the part of uh, supply side, I um, I concentrated on the uh, mobil uh, mobilizing structures and the appeal that uh, uh, that support people to take part in the protest, uh, um, that their demand was met by the uh, organization, by the structures that uh, allow them somehow, allow them, support them to take part in the uh, in the protest. From the demand side, uh, I, I focus on the uh, four categories, social political characteristic, because we all know um, uh, that uh, a particular certain group of people are more keen to take part or maybe another way more often take part in the uh, in the protest than other uh, groups uh, of people so i studied i try to study also that uh, social embeddedness as we know that uh, um, being in in a, a kind of network in a group of people in our organizations um, uh, can also influence the uh, the people's demand to uh, to protest because the main uh, issue is why in uh, societies in which for instance we have as you can see as a third factor uh, grievances, emotions. Um, although we can we can observe those emotions and frus uh, frustration in some uh, societies um, with a high level of uh, frustration and grievances, we cannot observe the uh, protest. But in another um, groups, we we can. Um, so that's why I I, uh, I focus also on uh, such issue. Also, group uh, group and, uh, identification. We know that, for instance, we have very very lively theories like uh, a social identity theory which uh, focus on the uh, on the uh, uh, reasons that people uh, take part in collective uh, uh, activities and collective mobilization due to uh, being uh, being of a uh, of a groups uh, of a particular groups and uh, uh, kind of need to uh, to have a good image of its own group so this is the theoretical framework and as, uh, as I said we already had uh, almost eight, eight years uh, uh, since the uh, since the already uh, eight years since the uh, sunflower movement uh, so um, I based my uh, my uh, data the data I collected um, uh, was of course the desk uh, 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 desk research so uh, I used uh, uh, I used the data that we have for instance collected by NCCU uh, uh, like uh, election uh, study center, uh, Taiwan election and democratization study center, uh, collected by NCCU, but also the qualitative uh, uh, data uh, collected, for instance, in the day, uh, daybreak project. We already have there. We uh, we have there uh, more than 50 interviews with the participants of 2014 in the Sunflare movement. So people who were uh, taken part in that uh, in that protest. And of course, I also also try to uh, conduct my semi-structured uh, interviews expert interviews with the people who were uh, uh, who were uh, uh, members who are uh, who took part in that protest um, and and um, also who uh, people who uh, observed those uh, protests um, um, so um, 
as you can see, uh, uh, as you can see, the, uh, I would like to divide the presentation to few um, a few uh, points. Uh, um, I think that uh, um, we already know something about the supply movement, so I concentrate on the supply side and demand side of uh, um, of the reasons and the factors that uh, that force people to take part in the uh, in the process. When it comes to the reasons for collective mobilization, I already said that we can divide it, uh, that into demand side and the uh, supply uh, side. Um, so let me uh, skip uh, that uh, uh, that uh, uh, part. Uh, when it comes to the sunflower movement, I also think that we already know a lot about about sunflower movement, especially during the Taiwan uh, uh, Congress. Um, we also could hear uh, during the presentation of Dr. Wu about one of the one of the very important uh, um, uh, issue that uh, uh, mobilized people to take part in the protests. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean the, the death of uh, the candidate, uh, uh, military candidate uh, uh, Hong uh, uh, in 2013. So we uh, know what were the reasons of the sunflower uh, sunflower movement, but let's uh, go back. Uh, let, let's uh, go to the. Uh, to the uh, supply side of the reasons and the factors that uh, that uh, uh, force people to take part in the uh, in the protest. When it comes to the mobilizing uh, structures, um, almost everyone in the, uh, in the uh, interviews uh, mentioned uh, uh, directly or indirectly very important formative role of the pro protest. We could observe not only in 2014, but before that in 2010, anti-media monopoly movement in 2018, well-known widespread Strawberry movement, um, a lot of a lot of smaller protests in 2014. Um, so uh, uh, almost everyone in the interviews uh, mentioned those protests. So we can uh, uh, we can uh, that why somehow uh, emphasize and support the theories which uh, says about about formative role of the pure protests. We know that um, uh, this is somehow uh, uh, this is justified also when it comes to the previous uh, uh, research that um, people who took part in the uh, in the protest before are more keen to take part in the protest in in future so here we can observe this this formative process uh, uh, the people learning how to take part in the protest building the network network in the previous uh, uh, protest this is very good uh, sunflower movement is a very good example of uh, um, of uh, such uh, factors um uh, uh of course when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the other uh, uh, points which we can uh, uh, can uh, call mobilizing uh, uh, structures um we all know that uh, um, a lot of uh, NGOs, mostly concentrated on the human rights, who, uh, took part in the uh, in the uh, sunflower movement. Uh, so uh, those organizations, as we could uh, as we could observe, and as we know, also thanks to the interviews, a lot of participants, uh, a lot of participants uh, took part. Uh, thanks to the involvement in some other, very often even a smaller uh, NGOs organization that uh, mobilized them to take part in the in the protest in 2000 um, in 2014 um, sunflower movement is also and we already have some papers on that um, interesting case of uh, role of the social media uh, social media but when it comes to the uh, to the sunflower movement maybe this is because it was 2013. So of course we already had uh, Facebook then, uh, Twitter, and other uh, social media. But uh, um, mostly when it comes to the interviews, uh, uh, people uh, underlined the uh, uh, dissemination of information. Uh, so maybe it was not a kind of uh, formative structure because when it, we compare, if we could compare something like movement, for instance, to the uh, uh, to the uh, um, uh, Hong Kong protest. Uh, 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 I mean, umbrella movement. Then uh, uh, Facebook and the groups, internet groups, very often played an important formative, uh, 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 formative uh, uh, role. Uh, here, at least the, during the interviews, uh, um, uh, everyone emphasized mostly this uh, uh, dissemination of information. Um, another uh, factor uh, when it comes to the supply side is the appeal. So I think I think that when it comes to the appeal, we also know. 
we also know more, more or less uh, uh, what was about. We we can divide that into few groups of the uh, of the grievances, for instance, that people uh, that people presented and the appeal that was presented during the protest. But what is interesting, almost in every interview, for also which uh, which I uh, conducted, this well-known black box term was mentioned. Um, so uh, this is one of the one of the uh, uh, part of that appeal, which which uh, occur almost in every every interview that we uh, that we um, that we had that we uh, uh, mm, 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 uh, conducted. Um, of course, we know about the, the other uh, issues like uh, uh, the role of the of the PRC and uh, uh, the role of the of the free uh, market, uh, uh, the globalization. We had also some leftist uh, organization taking part in that process. We know also the administration of KMT and President Ma. But uh, what also uh, is quite visible when it comes to the um, to the interviews, uh, of course, this Taiwanese identity was also kind of important part of the appeal of the appeal uh, that we have, even if not directly mentioned by the interviews. Um, uh, when we go to the demand side, so what makes people to what what make make people to take part in that uh, protest? Uh, as I uh, as I said, in uh, many uh, uh, social uh, psychological theories, uh, uh, we have this uh, concentration, this emphasizing on the uh, social political uh, characteristic of the participant, and very often uh, we know that youth uh, are mostly uh, mostly those who take part in the protest. And here, of course, we also had uh, had uh, the uh, so again, we can uh, uh, the uh, sunflower movement uh, justify justify the theories that we uh, already have. So it suits very well to the to the theories, for instance, when it comes to the uh, to the role of the youth, because uh, we know that um, more than uh, seventy four percent of the participants were the people under the their thirties, uh, uh, very often presenting uh, progressive values comparing to the to the older uh, uh, generation. Uh, a social embeddedness, uh, another factor, very important. So, uh, social embeddedness ask somehow is about uh, what were the organization, informal groups, internet communities that played role in building the social network of participants, how participants were linked to the other actors, um, and so on. Um, and uh, here is a very interesting issue when we. Uh, uh, we talk with the uh, kind of leaders, uh, although we know that Sunflower movement was was kind of leaderless uh, uh, movement. But of course, we we can uh, we can uh, uh, show the the, the um, let's say the, the activist of that uh, of that protest. Um, many of them mentioned in the interviews the role of the students group uh, uh, that they discuss, uh, uh, they raise some social uh, social issues, uh, very important. So this is something something quite interesting for the social scientists, the role of the, the academic uh, 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 environment, let's say, when it comes to the uh, to uh, this uh, demand side and this social abandonness of group. Uh, I already mentioned the role of the NGOs and the protest movement that we could uh, uh, could observe. Very important when it comes to the uh, to the demand side in the uh, uh, social protests uh, are, as I said, the grievances, emotions, and and uh, so on. Um, so why people were uh, angry? Uh, what are the what are the grievances of those people? Uh, here uh, in the interviews that we uh, that we had that uh, we collected that uh, I studied um, mm, this is quite similar to the to the appeal that we I already mentioned uh, so we can see uh, the uh, uh, the need for a transparency of public light quality of democracy uh, also mentioned uh, very often raising inequalities among the youth people so they were afraid of, about the economic future uh, future of of uh, uh, them and of course the role of this taiwanese uh, identity which uh, uh, we know for instance when it comes to the studies of nccu that we can observe the raising taiwanese identity mostly among the young uh, people um, when it comes to the uh, uh, to the last uh, 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 factor, so the uh, group uh, identification, this is very interesting. We also know about this uh, term of seventh graders, strawberry tribe, uh, tribe. Uh, so the people born in the uh, between the uh, 1980s and 1990s. Uh, many uh, participants were uh, people born in that um, decades, uh, uh, and uh, that's interesting that we can observe also in the interviews the. Uh, 
kind of general uh, general link among those people who took part in the protest. Um, some of them uh, felt uh, uh, as a kind of defenders of the democracy in, in Taiwan. So th this was this, also this generational link, uh, and uh, it was building the group identification of those young uh, people. So when it comes to the conclusions, um, we see that uh, uh, sunflower movement uh, 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 justified, let's say, the the the, the, the theories that we have about the uh, 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 the question why people take in, in protest. Here we can we can observe that the role of of uh, 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 relative deprivation, collective identity, a very important issue of this learning process, taking part in the pure protest, is very important to build uh, uh, the. Uh, demand uh, side uh, uh, of uh, uh, taking part in the protest, and this is why the people took part in the, uh, the protest in 2014. Thank you very much. I will be very happy to to answer any question. Hopefully, I did not uh, talk too long. Uh, um, thank you, and uh, waiting for Q and A. Thank you very much. Other presenters, um, let us invite the presenters to the front and we will start the Q&A session. So please um, come to the front. If you would like to ask a question to Dr. Zameki, uh, you can either come here and then speak directly to the microphone or you can tell me and I'll try my best to reconstruct your argument to Dr. Zameki. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, and if somebody is ask, uh, answering a, a question, even at live, please also come to the front so the people who are participating online can hear your responses as well. All right, so let's open up. Are there any questions to any of the presenters? Yes, please. Yeah, just go ahead. Thank you for your wonderful presentations, all of you, and uh, as well. Please come here. <laughs> I have questions to consult first for Karis. I uh, enjoyed a lot of your paper, but one question, how do we evaluate the distrust of government? I know a lot, and uh, personally, I'm also seeing a lot of the uh, papers, especially on Taiwan Inside, we capture a lot of the reports. But this is a question I can't really talk about. So just want to consult your uh, opinion on that. And can we hold on to that so that we can have Dr. Templeton, um, Templeman answer that? So the question was, how do we evaluate this trust in Taiwan? And Dr. Templeman, uh, if you would like to answer it on the mic. Uh, sure. Um, so I'm I'm not a public opinion expert, and there are probably people in the room who could answer this better than I. But um, my understanding of that literature is that trust in political institutions in democracies around the world is declining. And so while Taiwan's trust in democratic institutions also shows those declines, it's not, it's not out of line with everything else. Uh, and uh, my other go-to on this is uh, Russell Dalton, uh, a prominent political scientist, I think from UC Irvine, right? Um, I, I saw him give a talk on this and, and that question, his answer to that question was democracy teaches us to bitch. It teaches us to complain. Uh, and so countries that have been democratic longer actually see this decline in institutions after a transition away from authoritarianism. And so what Taiwan is experiencing is actually uh, a pretty consistent pattern across the third wave democracies. Uh, so while it's not encouraging to see that, it, I also don't think it's, uh, it's a sign that democracy is in some kind of terminal decline in Taiwan. So uh, that's about all I can say on that question for now. Yeah. So I go ahead and interrupt the I'm sorry that I sort of occupied. No worries, go ahead. To uh, Mary, yes, I really appreciate your presentation. It's the first time I've heard from the military uh, side. So very good, thank you. But my question may be a little bit aside from your uh, leadership management um, structure. It's just the current Russia invading Ukraine and prompt us, or at least me myself, to think whether Taiwan uh, mentally or actually military preparation wise is up in the society to face a very potential China invasion. So 
in a sense, my question to you is from your profession as a military professional, whether Taiwan is up. I'm not talking about the weaponry side, but just thinking of our military service shrinking into four months. Are we ready or if as the threat is coming? Society-wise, can we be so resilient as the Ukrainian society? Yeah, uh, uh, sorry, could you come to the microphone? And um, for people online, the, the, uh, the question was whether the Taiwanese military is up to the task of preparing for a potential invasion of China. And this is beyond just weaponry, but an overall assessment of preparedness. I the floor is yours. Um, so as for Russian Ukraine crisis, actually that each department of army headquarters has to conduct the research about that. For example, that um, on March, um, I mean, on 1st of March, that I was asked to, to do the entire uh, analyst about how Russia and uh, Ukraine using electronic fight, war fight, uh, war, warfare and uh, UAV and uh, information warfare. So, by doing that research, we will be able to uh, do the procurement, potential procurement in communication equipment. So that's one part. And as for the question that you ask about, are we ready to facing this kind of, um, uh, you would say, um, war? Uh, there's no uh, research uh, has been. There's no research being conducted in the military that. Are you ready to go to war? There's no, and I believe that no one dare to do that because we are ready. <laughs> I have to, yeah, I have to say that. And um, China is always our potential enemy, and no matter what uh, what field we are doing, uh, including the weaponry procurement, we are all uh, targeting uh, about China's threat. So we keep a uh, close eyes on how China PLA was, has, uh, will be developed in the uh, either technology and uh, tactical uh, methodology they are using. So I would say mentally or physically, we are ready to go to the war. But since now the war happens that in Ukraine and Russia is not about just Russia and Ukraine is worldwide, worldwide uh, involvement. And then the other question will come with the one is that, is American going to help us? So uh, that's not the question we are going to ask ourselves as a soldier. So we, in our, in our um, the operational concept, there's no American soldier involvement. So which means that we go for war and we use our own technique and all strategy to fight, to fight for China, uh, to fight for Taiwan. So uh, that would be the the answer that for your question. And but I'm glad that you asked about uh, how Taiwan uh, military society has been involved with the international crisis. So that will give us a very general and a very uh, clear idea about how the world war is going on so that we will ab we'll be able to get the get ready and to uh, also we uh, have we will have a fully understanding about what the future might be in terms of the conflict between China and Taiwan thanks well, thank you for that response uh, other questions um, let's start here So, you know, 2001 to now, you've, you've had two touch of Dan eras, two mind Joe eras, and now two Taiwan eras. And, and I totally buy that, you know, Taiwan is more democratic over the last couple of decades. Uh, what I'd love to, what I think would be really interesting to look more into is kind of the timing. Like, did these things kind of institutionalize at a steady rate? Uh, because I think, of course, when you, when, you, when you show that this kind of uh, institutionalization of democratic norms kind of Rose. I think there's going to be people that are going to, uh, you know, attribute causation to which party was in power. Uh, and I think it would be very interesting to look at when, you know, were there certain policy areas in which these 
kind of came into effect. Um, the other kind of nonpartisan explanation that I think would be really interesting to look into is the 2005 electoral reform. Uh, as, as you mentioned, I think that, that, that would, that's kind of really understudied critical juncture in Taiwan's politics. Uh, but I think it really could be an interesting way to look at, you know, how did that change the ability to pass this kind of really public policies that uh, kind of solidify democratization. Perfect. That's a very long question. I'll try to get the gist of it. Um, the, the question essentially asks, in the process of democratization, what is the critical importance of timing, especially critical events and perhaps the change of political power uh, parties? Do these things either speed up or slow down the process of democratization? Hopefully that captures things. Go ahead. Thanks, Lev. Uh, I would love to do that. Uh, and in the paper, I try to do that a little bit for some of the the problem areas that Diamond has. Um, in addition to the 2005 electoral reform, there's a, a bunch of other changes to the institutions that are even less prominent and uh, I think less studied, but equally as important. So one is the transformation of counties and cities into special municipalities. Uh, under Taiwan law, that eliminates a whole level of directly elected local officials uh, at the township level. And the township level used to be kind of the nodes in these factional structures that were involved in exploiting the public purse for private gain. And so uh, Sarah Newland and uh, John Leo actually have a paper showing that in one of these municipalities, when it was converted to uh, directly uh, to, to a special municipality and the district or the, the township heads were then converted to appointed district heads, they got better responsiveness. They actually looked at before and after, and it turned out governance got better. Uh, and so that, to me, is uh, an underappreciated institutional reform that, uh, if you look at Diamond in 2001, he's basically calling for that. Uh, and it's happened kind of piecemeal uh, throughout about, I think, about 70% of Taiwan's uh, jurisdictions. Um, another one is they, the DPP required the election of county speakers and deputy speakers to be open ballot. Uh, and that eliminated the possibility, uh, like you got in Kaohsiung and um, where was it? both Kaohsiung County and city, where uh, a KMT counselor could go around and bribe everybody uh, and end up, when they opened the ballot box, as the speaker or the deputy speaker. Um, and uh, so the uh, DPP members had clearly voted for a KMT speaker. By, by making that transparent, that eliminates that possibility. It strengthens the party control over their own counselors. Um, and I, so in the paper, I list a few other reforms like that. And I would love to, yeah, you know, I could probably write a whole paper just on this particular topic, and maybe I will. I don't, um, this is, I'm, I'm realizing I'm trying to cram way too much into this one paper, I think. Um, but uh, thank you for that suggestion. Um, the other thing I wanted to respond to was who gets credit or blame for what's happening. And I think it really depends on the issue area you're looking at. Um, uh, in particular, um, so uh, prosecution of political corruption, I think the, the critical moment I describe in the paper was uh, right after the 2008 elections, the prosecutor's offices go after a bunch of KMT legislators for vote buying. And in all five cases, the legislators lose their seats. Uh, there's a by-election, and then the KMT loses that seat. And the Ma administration, to their credit, does not intervene in that process, allows the prosecutors to go after them. Uh, and that, I think, provides a stronger deterrent against vote buying in future elections. And so I don't know whether to credit that to the prosecutors, to Ma, uh, to uh, you know, local voters who reported it. That, to me, seems like more, much more of a kind of systemic change that... Um, uh, you know, I don't want to say DPP is cleaner than KMT or vice versa um, uh, until I have some concrete evidence of that. But that that that's a, another critical moment. So um, appreciate the suggestion, and I will I will try to develop that in future iterations. Thank you. We had a question over here. Yeah, let's start, and then we'll go over here. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Professor Lipinski, for pointing out the impossibility of uh, the queer couple from uh, cross-national uh, marriage, because I have a personal feeling that this is so difficult for, for example, if your partner is from the ROC, so the LGBTQ 
national cross national marriage is always subsumed to the cross grade uh, issues. Yeah. And yeah, so uh, the invisibility of these couples of different countries where uh, maybe one partner of uh, the country is not sanctioned same sex marriage, it's still very difficult for them to get married or even to meet each other annually. So I think even though we are very proud of ourselves to be the first Asian country to legalize same sex marriage, uh, we still have a long way to go. So I uh, have a question for uh, Yashi that uh, it's a very interesting paper and I enjoy your presentation very much. And uh, so my brother is from a special force in Taiwan and I heard a lot from him about the similar issues that I just mentioned. So my question is more a practical one, that uh, how do you, how do we make the most out of your research? What's your next step? Uh, like, can you submit this research or your result to some uh, bureaucratic or officials? And who will be likely to uh, listen to your suggestion? Yeah, that's very uh, hang on. Let me reconstruct this. <laughs> so this is an acknowledgement to Dr. Levinsky for highlighting the difficulties of cross-national same-sex marriage, which is often overlooked despite the, the seemingly progress in same-sex marriage in Taiwan. And the question for Jiaxing is, what are the next steps? What are the applications and the implications of the research? For example, could we uh, submit this research to a policy report? Who will be the listeners? And then the floor is yours, Jiaxing. Uh, Thanks for your question. That's actually one of the struggles that I have gone through when I came here. Um, because they will question, they will go through the entire review of what my paper. Is that classified? Is that, uh, is that uh, sensitive enough? Is that okay for me to present overseas? Um, luckily, I got approved. That's why I'm, I got approve, approval. So why I'm here. And that about the next level of that, as I mentioned at the end of my presentation, that the commanding general, uh, Xu, he uh, cancel the active uh, the club activity and then and then change the hours of club activity into shooting exercise. So I would say that is the contribution of my research that someone in the high rank. Is listening, but he couldn't do so much to uh, organize or to 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 have a new policy because he is still underneath the minute uh, the defense minister. But I am sure in the future, uh, when he is thinking about a new policy, he he will definitely uh, consult with like uh, uh, the research in think tank. Um, so, uh, according to my position, I am not in the research department uh, in the army. So, which means that I am less convinced by my senior that I'm able to do research. But, um, and I will say that it's a very, uh, I will say, it's a pioneer research that I'm, I had conducted because I revealed the weakness of my our uh, policy weakness. I, I revealed the weakness of our policy making, and since that someone is was supported, um, so I would say that is a uh, it's a uh, it's a good start. But uh, I don't know what will happen in the future. Uh, but. I, I am confident enough about our new leadership in the future since that many of them are starting PhD now in Taiwan. I believe that education will make a huge change in military society to have a different perspective or use different lens to see the, the, the question instead of covering that. Thanks. Thank you. Given the time, we have time for one more question, please. I, I, let me quickly reconstruct the, the, the question. So the question is, there are different views about the progress of Taiwan's democratization process, and then the alternative arguments about the stalemate situation in Taiwan, and how do you recognize, reconcile these different perspectives on how to view democratization? Dr. Templeman. Yeah. Um, that's an excellent point, and I, uh, 
I reviewed that book for Richard, actually. I think I can say that now. Uh, so I pushed back a little bit on certain things. In particular, Taiwan's response to the COVID outbreak was world class. I mean, it was the best in the world, let's be honest. Uh, and so uh, at the time I got that manuscript, Taiwan had zero domestic transmission and the rest of the world was blowing up. And so uh, Richard, I think, did modify a little bit of the criticism. So there's, there's real state capacity in Taiwan to address uh, serious concerns. And it's less about the ability to mobilize bureaucrats or the, or, uh, the people who execute policy in Taiwan, and more about forging a kind of social and political consensus to tackle the major challenges that Taiwan faces. Uh, that's not unusual among democracies. We certainly have big problems in this country dealing forging that social consensus. The problem that Richard focuses on and that I think is accurate is that the bar is much higher for Taiwan. They're facing an existential threat from right across the strait. And so uh, if they kind of screw around for a few years uh, and don't deal with fiscal challenges or don't deal with military reform because there's not the kind of pressure, uh, that could ultimately affect Taiwan's ability to survive uh, into the future. And so uh, I, I agree with much of what Richard has said in that book, mostly because I, I think uh, not because Taiwan is less effective than the typical democracy, but because Taiwan needs to be so much better uh, in terms of addressing policy challenges head on in order to survive. Thank you. With that, uh, we had a very wonderful presentations and we have wonderful discussions. Again, let's give a round of applause to all the presenters. And thank you all for participating in this session. All right, so that's the end. Uh, we'll see you around. <laughs>